So let me introduce myself. My name is Oleg. I'm from Ukraine, from Kyiv. Have you ever been to Ukraine? Have you ever been to Ukraine before? Ooh, perfect. Yeah, I like you. Um, I work for Netify. At this company, I'm doing reactive programming, reactive streams on a daily basis. Actually, we are building the future of reactive streams, which is our socket. A part of that, I'm contributor to Project Reactor, which is one of the reactive streams implementation. But anyways, it doesn't matter. So I, have, I know something about, uh, about reactive streams, reactive programming, and its history. And OK, finally, let's talk a little bit about what we are going to cover today. And we are going to start with the story of reactive programming because it's important to understand why it, uh, it happened that we have like reactive streams nowadays. Then we are going to, to look at the state of the current state and what we have today in terms of libraries, etc. And we are going to finalize everything with the question whether it has any future. Sounds good? Yeah? Okay, let's start. So basically, reactive, it's about interaction. It's ability to react to the actions in like timely. However, let's start with the history. The first uh, mentioning of uh, word reactive is in the is happening in 1985 in the paper on the development of reactive system. And in this context, reactive uh, is coupled with system. So basically, reactive system is a type of the system which reacts to all of the changes, all of the events continuously without stopping. So you may wonder, what, what is the difference between non-reactive and reactive one, right? So let's take a look at the goose. Goose will be our, uh, our character during the whole presentation. So let's take a look at the goose. Goose is a simple bird, right? We are saying, OK, goose, go there, goose, go here, do that, do this. But goose is a simple bird. The most interesting for, go for goose is, for this type of bird, is what? Food, right? And the goose produce, as a result of eating food, you know what, right? So, Goose is a kind of non-reactive system, and it basically ignores everything what is, what is going outside of the world, and it's interested in only particular, particular signals. So this is basically a non-reactive system. In contrast, reactive goose or reactive system is a goose which changes its behavior all the time for as a reaction to all of the changes in the outside world. So basically, reactive system is a system which changes its behavior. For example, if one microservice is not available, then this one is not going to call it. This is the, this is the type of example of reactive system. So basically, we are not doing this particular thing. As we know, we changed our behavior as a result of this, for example, service and availability. All right. However, our talk is about reactive streams. So just remember that reactive is, is mentioning this reactive system at the, at the very beginning of the history, and we will see how reactive system impact reactive, the, the evolution of reactive programming and reactive streams. However, uh, the story started with UI. Why, you may wonder? Because in the 19th, two big companies like Microsoft and Macintosh started fighting for, for the market of uh, of, of good UI, of good uh, user experience operation systems. And basically, the problem of this period of time is that in order to build, to build proper, like, reactive or responsive UI, we have to use proper technology. So you may wonder, what does it, what, what it means? Let me show you a simple demo of what I'm saying. All right, let's take a look at this. You, you are a developer in 19. So you have to build an ability uh, of moving icons from one side to another. This is the simplest, right? So as a developer, what you could do? Let's take a look at the simple code. Basically, since you have only functions, you have your Fortran or whatever, or whatever language, the simplest you have been doing for, for the last 10 years, start, like before 19th, is like calling functions and getting the result using some array list and so forth and so on. So basically, what you as a developer can do, you can create a store like a queue, and instead of like, you don't have an API so far, what you can do is simply building functions which are doing some, some, some actions like moving one from object to another place. And the simplest what you can do is basically doing wide, like while true loop, right? Looping over, 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 over again and checking whether in your data structure there is new events. This is the simplest what you can do as a developer in 19. And of course, you have a trade-off. The first trade-off, you are doing this action periodically in order to save resources. And it ends up with something like that, right? Really a responsive UI, for sure. 
However, of course, you can tune this parameter, like you can say, okay, let me try to tune it a little bit. Like, let's put 100 of milliseconds per, per loop. Let's try it more frequently. And of course, it's gonna be looking a little bit better, and then you say, okay, let's put one. Let's do, let's do it just every, every, every uh, I don't know, tucked off of your CPU, and it will be much better. However, you are burning your CPU out, and in fact, in the 19th, you had only a single CPU on your computer, which is basically means you wasted all the resources and you can't process anything else. So basically, the problem is clear of this period of time. Um, and the solution came almost immediately. In 1992, Windows uh, and Microsoft produced a paper in which he sa uh, they say that, okay, we created a great even driven API, which let you basically build absolutely new, efficient, responsive programs. So let me show you what happened, basically. Basically, there were not that much changes, but uh, instead of pulling events, they decided to, to observe them, to push them. Okay, this is something different. Let me go back. And they decided to move from push to, from pull to push model, and this and this has changed, and this changed the, the UI and the responsiveness of UI significantly. So let's take a look at this, uh, at what happened. Basically, the good, the good things happened, and we started observing really, uh, we started reacting to events immediately, like on time, and that's why the, the, the user interface became more responsive and smooth. So basically what they've done, they decided to, to create some additional API like this, which let you introduce some handler or function of, or observer to, to, your, to your kind of system and put this handler and then process data and react to particular action almost immediately. That's the benefit that they created, basically. Sounds good, like, but we had some, we, we got, it turned out that we have some problems. Basically because we started evolving, instead of building just simple moving of one icon to another, we decided to create much more complicated interfaces, right? And from the one glance, uh, from the one uh, point, of, point of view, developers thought, okay, this is easy, right? What could be complex? However, in fact, there were too many pitfalls inside, so we started writing the source code like this, and we basically got what we've got, right? Um, okay, so to summarize the problematic of the next iteration of uh, development is that the complex processing is, became hard because we, instead of just reacting to, to one movement of mouse, we decided to build something more complex like animations. And it was impossible to, to reuse just observer pattern for doing that and without losing the, the clearness of the source code. However, the, the humanity found the solution, and basically this solution appeared in 1997 and got the name Functional Reactive Programming. And the most interesting, the, 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 the founder or the inventor of this was someone from Microsoft again. This was Connell Elliott, who published a paper, React Functional Reactive Animation. And you may wonder, okay, what is, this is basically the second mention of reactive over the history. You may wonder, what is, what is that? What is functional reactive? Basically, what they decided to do, they decided to create a set of uh, data structures, operators, some additional DSL for building this, for constructing this complex processing and pipelines, which, is, which basically are, are a result of, uh, of your mouse movement and other events from, from user input. So basically, they, uh, in order to build such a, complex, such a complex animation, you only had to write a couple of, uh, of lines of code, which is amazing. All right, so to summarize this part, it seemed that like observant pattern became like a, a main technique for building responsive UI, responsive application. Functional reactive animation as a solution, as a like technique, another technique, improved the, the, the observer pattern because it added uh, to it the ability to, 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 to write something in a clear DSA, DSL which um, saved a lot, of, uh, a lot of space and made your, your code much, much cleaner. However, we started moving to the next iteration and we turned into the new millennium. And do you remember what, what appeared in, in the 2000s? Do you remember? Basically, let me help you a little bit. Basically, we started building distributed system. And the problematic of this period, in order to build efficient distributed system, or like system which is communicating over the wire, over the network, 
we have to use a proper set of technologies. So let me, let me show you uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying, basically. So let's go forward and let's um, take a look at the simple example. So one of the simplest examples is communication between, uh, for example, cl between client and server or browser and, and server over the wire, right, over the network. And for example, your server has to return, has to return a, couple of, a couple of things or a couple of pages. So let me show you an example first. So this is, this is, oh, please stop. Okay, I have to uncommand this stuff. So basically what we've got is two services here. Here is a client and here is a server. And the server on the, on the right side is the holder of, of any data, of knowledge. In our main goal of this, of this emulation is to collect 20 items or 20 pages. Of course, the problem became is not just simply get 20 items from, from, the, from that side. The problem is getting to the point that we have to filter them, we have to find something which is suitable for our needs. So we are basically filtering them, that's why not all of the events are getting into, into the client side. However, we have to request. So basically, before it was a simple calling of, of, of function which was pretty efficient. We call it like give me this item and we almost immediately get, got, um, got an, an answer or a response because like local hardware, it's pretty efficient. We don't care a lot about like latency between calling and function and we uh, assume that this is only, almost immediate. However, with the appearance of the network between our client and server or between our caller and responder, change the situation, change the game significantly. So let me show you. I have something called constants, which basically let me configure my emulation. And in this, in this constants, I'm adding a latency, basically one, one, one second of latency, right? Because the network was slow in this period of time. And let's take a look how it's changing. The most important for us in this simulation is time of execution. So you can see on the top we have this timer which basically says how much time did we spend on the execution of this process, which basically will be some measurement of, of, of the efficiency of our algorithm or technique. So if we're going to look at this, we will see that it will take some time to, to get the items because now our response and request are delayed for two seconds almost. And even though we increase the speed of our, of our emulation, we would have to wait for a couple of minutes, which is wasteful. Of course, they say it okay, the developers say it okay, why not simply to bring everything from, from the server side to the client side, right? This is the, the most simplest solution. And we tried this on local machine and it worked, right? So what we can do is basically we can say, okay, Instead of going over, over the wire all the time, let's go for, let's request everything, cache it on our client side, and then we will operate with the data on our side without going over the wire, which is, of course, slow. So, good idea from the first glance. And it worked because, yeah, we, we requested everything and we almost, really, almost immediately started processing everything, and, and that's it. We got Process, uh, processing of everything for, for eight seconds, for example. However, we have some limitations as well, which is basically our machines. Our machines are not unlimited, right? We, don't build, we are not building mainframes. Of course, some, some of, I don't know, past of the companies are, were building them, but not today, for example, and not in the night, uh, in 2000. The problem that we, we, are, we are limited in memory, and in, for example, in uh, network capacity as well, we have some bandwidth, which is significant for us. So we can't ignore that. So for example, if you are getting a gigabytes of data, then we have to, to understand that we won't be able to, to flare them immediately. That's why what it means. Basically, we have a few more constants in our, in our applications like network throughput. For example, we have 23 item, like some ephemeral item, 23 item of, of throughput for, for, our, for our network. How it turned out then? Basically, our response generated at the same time on the server side would have to be split into several, several parts. And we would have to wait a little bit more because they all would have to be delivered. And then, like, you know, we process in JSON, or, JSON, JSON array only when we got the whole JSON array on our side. So it, it increased the processing time for two seconds, for example. However, that's not the only limitation. We have memory, and this memory is not limited. So for example, let's say, okay, we are limited in capacity of our computer for 23 items as well. 
So it means that we are not able to get more than 23. How turn, how change the game again? So it's basically, it basically added memory here. As you can see, like, it's now full because we got the first chunk of response. And you may get the understanding of what happened next. The next what happened is basically out of memory because we are not able to, to put more than we have like capacity. And yeah, basically the, the humanity and the people understood the problem as well and said, okay, what we can do? Simply batching, right? We're all doing batching nowadays. So if we can't put everything at once in our memory, let's do some batching and let's request, request some data in, in batches and process them like a synchron not a synchronously, but once we got this batch, batch and then request uh, another one. So basically, it improved the, the processing like, or, or stability of the system. We started requesting, processing, and again requesting. But yeah, as you can see, it, this, it started taking much more time than before because now we have to make a little bit more hops over the wire in order to make sure that we got all the data that we needed. So basically, Let's go back to, to our slides and let's summarize. Basically, the downside of all of these techniques is that like pulling elements one by one is totally inefficient. The network bandwidth is not like unlimited and the memory and the hardware and everything on which we are operating is not limited, is unlimited, is not unlimited as well, which is basically a problem. So there is the same problems basically uh, the team at Microsoft in 2000 uh, face it as well. Basically, you may wonder why Microsoft again. Basically, Microsoft in 2000 started building their Azure, their uh, cloud, and they, they needed to, to send terabytes of data from one service to another and make sure that this is pretty efficient. And what happened, basically, one of the lead of the team which were uh, which were working on, um, which was, who was working on, on this problem was Eric Mayer, and he decided, whoa, why we are doing pooling? Let's do, instead of pulling, a synchronous pushing, like we've done it before in responsive UI. Let's do the same. So basically, it's changed the game significantly. And it turned out that this is pretty efficient. So let's take a look at this simulation, and you will see right now. So basically, we are requesting the same number of elements, basically give me all. But in that case, all the elements are returning asynchronously one by one as they found in the database or at the server side. It basically means that we don't have to put everything at once into our network, which basically gives us more capacity for data sending in some way. And at the same time, our client or recipient can process them without keeping them in memory all the time, which is pretty efficient technique. And as you can see, it took twice less time that with batching which is pretty cool. All right, sound good. However, the problem became the same. So Eric Mayer, Eric Mayer decided to use observer pattern, but we remember that observer pattern is, is pretty hard. It's pretty complex. It's, it's inefficient because it's lack of, like, of particular things. At the same time, what Eric Mayer needed at this period of time is processing a stream of data or array of data, basically. What he needed is somewhat kind of iterator. And the problematic of those patterns, like observer pattern and iterator pattern independently, is that like observer pattern is pretty efficient, is push model which lets you synchronously process data, but it's unclear. Where is the end of the data? Where is how to unsubscribe, how to say, okay, I'm done. Don't send me any more data, please. I don't want to just simply drop them. I just want to say stop. And there were no such API, which is a problem. On the other hand, iterable was kind of clear in terms of where is the end, how to, uh, how to unsubscribe or close the iterator. However, the main problem is that iterator in its nature is pull mechanism. So as a result of thinking, Erin Mayer decided, OK, let's, let's try to improve. Let's try to use uh, what we've done before. Let's try to combine those operators. Let's use something that we, we invented before, like reactive animations. And by combining all these things, he got reactive extensions. 
And basically, reactive extensions from the first side, on the one hand, is a combination of observer and iterable, which basically got a rix and you got this observable, which has method subscribe. And as you can see, like this is the beginning of reactive system right now. Because now you are subscribing and saying that you are ready. So you are notifying the, the system, which could be a producer, that you are ready to, to get the data. And producers started producing data. Again, this is some reflection of reactive system here. And on the other hand, there is an observer which got like three methods on next, on error, and on complete. And basically on next let you react to all the new events or actions, and on error and on complete let you understand that this is the end of your execution or this is the enter the error and you don't have to expect any more, uh, any more elements. And there is a subscription which let you uh, like cancel your, your data stream without any problems. And it improved all the, uh, it improved the processing a lot because we got the synchronous push model, we, we, we got the way to, to clearly stop the, the, consu the consumption of the data and we understood where is the end. So this is perfect solution. And even more, counting the fact that there were DSL, now we, we were able to write something pretty, uh, pretty understandable, functional, and uh, clear in terms of execution, uh, execution model, and even more. As you can see, this, this technique, this paradigm spread, this went over the world, and we observed, like, we started seeing Rx or reactive extension for Swift, for JavaScript, for Java, for many, many languages, which basically is the same DSL with almost the same behaviors in the different languages. So, for example, reactive extension developer were able, uh, was able to, to write code in JavaScript as well as in Java, because the DSL is the same, which is perfect. Sound good? Let's summarize stuff. Basically, Eric solved the problem with efficient data sending. The development of complex asynchronous streaming processing became really simple, and it sounds okay, this is a win. However, there were a but in, in, in this period of history. The problem is that we consider it only a partial solution or partial uh, case of data streaming. The problem is that we consider it only a fast client and, um, yeah, where is our constants? The fast client and slow producer case. Let's not, not call it slow, but in that case, we can see that we have like a particular or constant lookup time, which is about 60 milliseconds. And as we can see, uh, we spent on processing around 30 seconds, 30 milliseconds, which twice less. It definitely means that our client will, will always have some time to process elements until the next one is going to come. However, what if our client is pretty slow enough? There is lots of cases where such thing could happen. Right, so let's consider, let's see what happened. Once our uh, client or subscriber will become much slower, like almost five times slower. Basically, let's go for our, our emulation and we will see that pretty fast we will get out of memory. And the main problem of that is that we can't say that we are not ready to consume elements at this point in time. That we got some full pocket memory right now, so please don't send me any more data. There is no such mechanism in uh, reactive extensions, unfortunately. So that was the main problem, that we got like a fast consumer, a uh, fast producer, slow consumer. A part of that, there were another issues with that. For example, like reactive extension in JavaScript and reactive extension in Java. What is the main difference except script? Any, any idea? Multi-threading maybe? There is no multi-threading in JavaScript, so probably behaviors of reactive extension for JavaScript will be totally different from reactive extension in Java, right? So we got the same DSL, the same kind of paradigm but the implementation were totally different because of different languages. And a part of that, a part of that, the implementation in even the same languages from different vendors became absolutely insane, which brought much more problems. So afterwards, we got the problem with slow subscriber, fast consumer, and like um, incompatibility of APIs because there were no API, there were just DSL or kind of DSL, uh, made some other problems. Actually, after some thinking, the big guys, big companies like Pivotal, like, uh, like Microsoft, like Netflix, 
um, and Twitter and many others, decided to unify all of these behaviors and create some standardized things like specification for reactive streams. So basically what they decided to do, they decided to improve one thing, basically stability. And in order to improve stability, we remember, in order to improve stability, we decided to use batching instead of give me all. So the same were applied here, kind of a synchronous batching, and combination of that gave us reactive streams, which brought us publisher interface with the same method subscribe, subscriber interface with the new method on subscribe, basically, which let us control the speed of elements over calling in subscription request method. So basically, subscription with request method gave us ability to control back pressure. That's the name that uh, we got afterwards in reactive streams. And basically, this is a synchronous batching and a synchronous way to, send, uh, to, to start sending elements from the producer side. And now subscriber is saying, OK, I'm ready to get 10 elements and producer produce them. So basically, it solved, again, we got this push model, we got batching, which is basically pull model. And it, we got a standardized set of interface, which basically standardized the behaviors for all vendors for different implementations as well. And it turned really well. So let me show you the, the demonstration of that. Um, yeah, let's go back. We don't change anything here. So we're keeping everything as it was before. And now we are using, instead of just streaming, we are using reactive streams, which is following these behaviors. And once we're going to look first, yeah, let me, let me show you first. We see that in order to start to let the, pro the producer, the publisher, start sending elements, we have to specify the first request. And in this case, we say, okay, the maximum capacity is 23 elements, so let's request 23 element, and then producer will know that it exactly has to produce 23 elements. Even though we are slow, the producer can produce really fast, but it knows that we requested only 23. And then we can slowly produce them, produce them, like process them, process them, and process. And once we got to some specific point, we, we know that th this is the speed of processing of elements. And this is the rest of them. So for example, let's request more in order to be efficient. And we can say, OK, give me another batch of elements asynchronously, without waiting, without blocking anything. And then the producer will be able to produce elements, and we will be able to still process continuously without stopping, which is pretty efficient, right? And then we can process, process, and we, it will take like super, super less time comparing to, like, to, to batching again, So which is cool. And even though we are going to, 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 to return to the previous configuration to fast subscriber, fast producer, we will see that it will be pretty efficient even in that case. But we, we will more frequently request for more, more data, but even though it will be like seven, seven seconds for processing, which is amazing. All right, let's go back to the slides and let's do uh, kind of summarizing of what we get nowadays. Because we got reactive stream specification in 2013, 2014, and basically, it's almost nowadays. And nowadays, we got a lot of uh, kind of improvements and movement in that area. Basically, we got reactive stream specification for C Sharp. We got reactive stream specification for JS. And we got reactive stream specification for Java. And we are improving. We are working on reactive specification for Swift and other languages, which is amazing. And even more. Vendors saw like, the benefits in, 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 that, um, in that paradigm, and they decided to implement different libraries as well. For example, we got Akka streams in Scala world. We got Rx Java 2 for Java. We got Project Reactor for backend in Java. We got Reactive for .NET, which is another implementation for C Sharp. And even more, we got Reactive Streams uh, Project Reactor for JavaScript, which is amazing. And th this is pretty cool because it became popu more popular and more popular and more popular, which is significant. And for, for us, I don't know, how many Java developers do I have here? Oh, almost everyone. For us, it's, oh, it's really important as well because we got reactive stream specification in JDK as a part of standardized library. And we have all of these interfaces starting from JDK 9, which is awesome. I like it. It means that this specification became super significant even for Java developers. So, OK, let, let's make a summary. Uh, Reactive Stream specifications became like a standard for a synchronous push-pull model in streaming. We got better stability, and yeah, this is, this is cool. Goose approves that. However, sounded good, but again, 
again. And the next problem that we got is basically hidden in us. And the main problematic is we, we all developers, and we don't want to solve any problems, right? We want new framework. Yes, that's what we want to do. That we want to try a new framework, right? And basically, what it means from from basically the ba the main the main pain point was in programming in, in the programming and functional DSL because we are not ready to to get this paradigm immediately. And it was easy when we start using map, take right flat map a single flat map at, uh, at least. And then it turned out that we have to write another flat map and another flat map, and then we have to shoot a couple of times in our, in our food because it's complex. And yeah, it's not easy in terms of implementation as well. So basically the problem became is that imperative programming is good and functional is really complex. So let's make imperative programming great again. And basically what people decided to do is they decided to move a little bit uh, of, of, uh, in a different direction from functional and reactive. And they decided to improve imperative. And what they created pretty recently, like in the past 10 years, is another paradigm. It's a few more keywords which let us process data asynchronously, non blockingly, in an imperative way. So they basically got a sync await. And you may wonder what, what, is, what is a sync await. Basically, a sync await is almost a killer for reactive extensions. And even in 2010, one of the active users of reactive extensions for .NET asked it whether iObservable will survive afterwards. And the answer of, like, of official maintainers was, yeah, 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 sure, it's going to survive. But we are ready to, to provide a replacement, call it I async enumerable, which is basically ability to process stream using imperative programming. So basically they created async streams and async enumerable, which let you write a code like this. So this is pretty imperative code, right? Nothing functional here. And the only things is that you are requesting a sync enumerator here, and then you're saying, okay, I want to iterate over this enumerator almost infinitely. And instead of just blocking the, 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 your thread, you are saying, okay, let's postpone it. Let's make a like, underlying state machine some magic for us, and we will do another stuff using this thread without blocking it. So we are calling await, and once we got an element, we can continuously iterate over it. Okay, let me go back. We can continuously iterate over it, consume elements, because this is basically a representation of Q. So you can take, take element, take, take, take until you got uh, for example, that there is no elements anymore, so you can say, okay, let's await again. And this could be continuous draining of elements from the queue without blocking, which is kind of streaming, right? And uh, it became really popular. So we got a sync await or a sync suspend in Kotlin. We got, we got a sync await in JavaScript in order to replace promises and reactive, reactive extensions for JavaScript. And we got this for, for C Sharp and even more. We got kind of kind of similar things in Java nowadays. Basically, we got Project Bloom, fibers, and basically lightweight green threads, which could be somewhat a replacement for, for, for reactive streams in Java, because Java was the main source of, of progress for reactive streams. And now we are, the, the Oracle developers, the GDK developers, are building the replacement for that, which is kind of, mm, this, is, this is not good. So the main question whether Reactive streams has any future, you know? So in order to understand whether it has any future, we have to understand trends, like Graal, for example, where we are moving. Do you know what is Graal? Any, just a couple of folks? Okay, the Graal basically is two things. A fast compiler, and um, the second thing is Truffle VM, which let you run any, almost any language on GVM. So basically, you can understand Graal and Truffle VM as, as this, like its ability to run any languages on the GVM, on the Java. And it basically means so now, if you're gonna run everything in a single, in a single environment, then your JavaScript can talk to your Python, can talk to your Java, can talk to your C Sharp, whatever languages, without any problems. And the question is how they are going to talk to each other, because now we, we have like a sync await implementation in GS, a sync await in C Sharp, some green threads in, G, in GVM, and the question how they are going to interact with each other, because there is no specification for that. There is specification for state machine in C Sharp, the same for GS, another for, I don't know, for Java, but are they, this, are they similar? What guarantees will you have once you're gonna call your async await function from JavaScript? I don't have a clue. However, if you know the standard 
and the standard is always the standard, right? It's always. And the specification is the power. This is not me. It's someone from Java Architects. They all love specifications. And specification is basically power. It means that using, for example, React to specification, we can get specified standardized behaviors, expected behaviors of streams of elements sending, and we will be able to connect one absolutely unrelated, like two absolutely unrelated platforms without any issues. So let me show you a simple example in order to make sure, to ensure you that this is possible without any problems. So let me do that really quickly. Basically what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna uh, connect I'm going to call reactive streams from the JavaScript. For any reason, you're building some, you're trying to adopt reactive programming in JS, or you want to use JS and call some legacy code in Java, for whatever reason. I'm, I want to call a function from, 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 from Java. Basically, I'm having a jar file here. Let me show you that. I'm having a jar file, some simple application which returns stream of project from project reactor. This is publisher, basically. And I want to continue doing the stream uh, in JavaScript. So basically, I'm calling this, I'm calling do work, and I'm using reactive, uh, reactive extensions for JavaScript adapter in order to, 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 do, to write some fancy code. So basically, once I'm going to run this stuff, yeah, this is, this is what you have to run, Growl, JS, and do some magic and combine JavaScript with, with your GVM. And you can see here is Growl.js. Once you're going to run it, you will see that I will be able to call data from JS and receive stream from Java, like produce it from Java. And as you can see, I, I have this request method and got 10 elements. And since I'm having here take 10, for example, I can change it. I can change it to give me five. And I would have to recompile this stuff because, okay, because it's like, it's uh, TCK. Yeah, it's something different. Um, because it's TypeScript. I'm using TypeScript for all the stuff. So I recompiled it. Now if I'm going to rerun this, you will see that um, I'm going to get five elements. Here we go, five elements. This is real back pressure. This is the same reactive streams with the same behaviors. And it will work in the same way as in Java in JavaScript as well, which is super powerful. All right, sound good, right? Super cool magic. But I'm, for example, web developer. How can I use these reactive streams for network? How can I send data with the same guarantees over the wire? Actually, you can do. There is our socket project, which is basically implementation of reactive streams as a wire protocol, as a network protocol. And you can use the same reactive streams in JavaScript, in Java, in C Sharp, in any platform with the same behaviors, but over the network, which is more, much more cooler. So let me show another demo pretty quickly, because we are almost run of the time. And I have to give the stage to another speaker. Um, yeah, index scroll, R socket. Yeah, I'm running a server. I'm running our socket server right now. And I'm going to open the browser. And I'm using, for example, let me show you this. I'm using Growl our socket, which is basically running our socket server. And here is the same reactive streams. And I'm calling here my GVM library. So I'm using Growl for calling GVM and then produce send data from GVM from jar file over node to, to the browser. And for, you, for that, I'm using our socket, like for sending data over the, over the wire. And if you can see, I'm going to open, so let me open, let me open this example, this R socket example, you will see. In this case, I'm receiving, I'm connected as a client, and then I'm expecting, give me a stream of elements. I subscribe it, and then I put the subscription into global space in order to control it manually, to show you that this is real reactive streams. So let me, let me open the browser, I'm opening the browser, and now nothing happened. I just word connected, connected to the server. Now I'm having like my subscription. And once I call give me 10 elements, I will get 10 elements. And if you're going to look at the console, you will see this is real request 10. Amazing. And I requested more. For example, let me request 15. You will see again. 15 and produce it. This is real back pressure and real reactive streams over wire, over different languages and environments. All right, let's go back. Oh no, this is not something I wanted to show you. Let's go back and let's do some summary. So, sounds good, but does it have any future? Basically, first of all, it, it, it does. You can easily nowadays combine absolutely different paradigms. You can use reactive streams 
in an imperative way. And you can get the power of reactive streams, for example, using Kotlin, Kotlin wrapper for that, which is cool. On the other hand, you have always understand where you have to apply reactive streams. For example, for that purpose, you have to use the goose coop, or actually this is a joke, this is Eric Mayer coops. But in any case, your, your system is a three, like, three dimension three-dimension coop, you have velocity or like the data storage, like big data or small data. You have velocity or speed of sending data, like your SLAs. And you have your database, basically, your foreign key, primary key, or key value storage. And it says that basically if you want to just build plain, slow application, maybe you want to have a sync away because it does not design it for big data, it doesn't design it for high speed, so you can use pull async await mechanism. On the other hand, if you want to build super fast the system uh, design it for big data with k-value storage, then you can use RxJava, Rx Java, for example, or reactive extensions. And as a kind of, uh, in the middle of that, you can use reactive streams, because reactive streams is a combination of pull and push model, so you can combine both of paradigms and, put, like, and tune them as you need in your particular case. All right, sounds good. The final summary is that finally, uh, like evolution of reactive streams became at the very beginning of the history of evolution of computers in 80, uh, 1985, um, yeah, 85. It turned out that the main reason for creation uh, reactive programming and uh, observer pattern was UI and responsive UI. Finally, we got everything standardized in order to make sure that it works plain and stably. And of course, standard is always a standard and um, you have to, to apply it properly. You have to remember that you can't just use a tool in order to, to, to nail whatever stuff. You have to think where you have to apply and for that purpose you have to use uh, the goose scoop. All right. This is it. If you got any question, please postpone it for, for backstage. If you want to look at, uh, at the source code, I'm going to share it with you as well. And the presentation is, will be shared with you as well. If you got any question, please ask them at Twitter or at the backstage afterwards. So thank you for your attention. And that's it from my side. Thank you, Alec.